Good afternoon, everyone. I am Joe Flick with the Montana State Library, and I'm here with Alan Ellis, and she is at the Billings Public Library. She's going to share some information with you about some of the work she's been doing with their children's collection to kind of increase the inclusivity and diversity in that collection. So, Alan, I'm going to turn everything over to you, and I'll keep an eye on that chat box. And anyone, if you would like to unmute your microphone and just um, jump in with a question. That's perfectly fine. We are a, a small, <laughs> fairly small group here today. So happy to have you all. Okay. Alrighty. So again, thank you. Um, my name is Alan Ellis and I am the children's librarian at Billings Public Library. So I'm glad that you could join me today. Um, we're going to talk about um, Billings Public Library's journey into inclusivity and diversity. And you'll notice that I said a journey because that really never ends. It isn't like one day you wake up and say, oh, I think we have enough diverse books in our collection. So this is something that keeps going on. And it's actually a way that we kind of have started, not kind of, we are looking at our collection at Billings Public Library. So first thing we should talk about is what is diversity and inclusivity and why is it so important? Um, children's books not only explore the alphabet, or counting or our favorite TV characters, but they also help children develop their own identity. Books provide both mirrors and windows into the world. Diverse books provide a mirror when they reflect the, your own culture, thus helping you identify yourself. And a book acting as a window offers you a view into someone else's experiences. And it's really, really critical to understand that both children and adults cannot truly learn about themselves until they understand others. So being diverse refers to the traits and characteristics that make someone unique, while inclusion refers to the behaviors and the social norms that ensure people feel welcome. So you're gonna hear, you hear diversity and inclusivity kind of inter, interacted between each other a lot, but it's important to understand that um, a diverse book means, or diverse collection or diverse programming means that you, um, referring to the traits of people and inclusion um, actually refers to making people feel welcome by how what you do how what you say so um how did billings public library get started on this um path in um the fall of 2018 so um, almost two years ago a member of the city of billings's human relations commission came to our children's librarian who was at that time, Cindy Patterson, and asked about a book list. Um, the Human Relations Commission is a group elected by the city mayor and their main responsibility is to work with people who file complaints against the city and the city employees. And the members of this commission asked if Billings Public Library had a list of diverse books that we could make available to the public and to the teachers of school district too. They wanted us, they wanted to build a more tolerant community and they thought um, being able to present people with books about other cultures, giving that window to the community. Now, as you can imagine, um, many times we get um, requests for things like this and you think, oh sure, let me put, a get, put together a book list for you. But this was not as easy as we thought it was going to be. Um, it was actually a lot more, what they were requesting was a lot more than just a book list as we delved into what um, they actually wanted. We had to start thinking, what does it mean to be inclusive? What does it mean to buy, be diverse? And what should those book lists look like? And that's what started us on a journey to changing our collection at Billings Public Library, um, how we develop our collection, and we also learned a lot about the writing and publishing of children's books. As we started to talk to the Human Relations Commission about what they wanted, it became apparent to, apparent to us that our book collection really wasn't that diverse. Um, we had books about and with other cultures, but it was really pretty superficial. Many of the books were written by people outside the community they were writing about, or just simply about a community that they really knew nothing about. This meant we had to have a conversation about what a diverse collection and inclusive collection looks like and what we wanted our collection to look like. This, um, this step is very important 
because you need to be able to think about what your you need to you need to take a step back and look at what your collection looks like and that can be a sensitive subject um, for many of us we we developed that collection ourselves and many items in that collection that we that had been developed for years were they were unintentionally by our sake they were unintentionally racist sexist homophobic and that was especially hard for say our children's librarian who've been there a long time for us to have to take a step back and look at our collection um and as Maya Angelou says on this slide, um, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. And that's what happened. We had to take time to reflect on what our collection was and why it was there. And especially if you are the lone or sole purchaser of your collection, your collection becomes very personal. It's your collection and you be, can become defensive and hurt when the discussion turns to the items that shouldn't be in your collection. When people start saying to you, you know, <clears throat> that's racist or that's homophobic, you can feel very um, personally attacked. And so the first thing you have to remember is that this is not a personal attack. This is a book collection that should grow and change and evolve. And it's a hard lesson for all of us, learning to be humble and to take a step back and be objective in what you see. And so that's why I chose the Maya Angelou collection because it really is, once you know better, you do better. How are we doing? Anybody got any questions right now? No? So I want to kind of- Nothing quite that. yet, but I, I do want to just um, reflect a yes. little bit about me, this is Joe here, and it is a humbling experience. I'm glad you used that word. I think coming into this, um, much of what we uh, tried to do to be inclusive, um, you know, it's hard when you are from the dominant culture to um, do that right the first time. It's definitely a learning, it, it's a journey, as you said. Yeah, not even the first time, second time. I mean, third time, <laughs> fourth time. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, it was, as we talk about this, you know, there are many times when we purchase a book and then later on, I meet me, might read a whole nother review of the book and say, I didn't see that, I didn't think of that. Um, and again, so it's just being aware of that and being open to someone else's opinion. And as you said, as the major, um, you know, I'm a, um, you can't see me, but I promise you, I'm a white woman. Um, I, I'm a dominant culture. So for me, I have to, I have to really be humble about um, my thoughts on books because I, most of the time these diverse books are not, you know, yes, women's literature, but they're not going to include me. You know, I, my opinion is not important in some of these purchases because they're not about my culture or about my, um, my identity. And so you do have to take a moment to kind of be humble about that and not assume that because you are the children's librarian or because you're the purchaser of these books or because you have a certain degree that you know everything. Um, so um, I thought I would pick a few books from our children's collection and kind of have a little discussion about what may possibly be wrong with these books. Um, yes, all four of these books are still in the Billings Public Library collection. Mostly the main reason they are in the collection is because they're popular and they're requested. They're also in the collection because they're a great opportunity to use to talk about why we don't do the things we used to do. They're good for research. So the first one here, Julie of the Wolves, which is a much loved book used by lots of teachers um, units are built around this book, but this book is not an okay book. Does anybody want to jump in and say why? Any thoughts? Let's give everybody a chance to get in to the chat box or that takes a little bit of time. I have absolutely no idea. Um, so 
let's hear what everybody else has to say. What would be the issue related to this book? Oh, Ken, Kendall's, Ken, Ken from Polson. Uh, the author is represented a people group for which she does not herself identify. That is true. That is true. So yep. Jean Craighead George does not sound like a person who lives in a um, native community in the north. That is true. Yep. You're right, though. It's a very much love book. It is. Christine and says there's sexual content. Oh, now see that I have not heard. Um, we uh, when we when we're talking about a diverse and inclusive inclusive book, we are not so much concerned about content that some parents might find um, alarming or inappropriate for age level. Um, because you're right, it does. It, it, I don't know that it does or not. I've not truly. I've not read the book. But um, the main reason that is cited on numerous websites, including um, Debbie Reese, who we will talk about later, is that there are numerous instances of misinformation about the Arctic and its people. Um, okay. And Nikki, it's actually Christine's, um, actually Nikki, and she says she really loved the book when she was a middle schooler. Oh, it is very, I mean, it's an, it was an award-winning book. It's gotten a lot of attention, but unfortunately, but, it's but, not correct it, rep it misrepresents native the native exactly. people exactly yes, even if it does. it does that a little bit it's problematic yes so and 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 i don't remember we talked about it earlier this is not a case to get defensive about the fact that you loved it or it's a well-loved book or as you can see a well-loved movie or the author is well loved that is not my point in any way shape or form am i telling you whether or not to have the book in your collection or not have the book in your collection Really, this is just a case of us taking a moment to look at the books from with from without without being a white person or without being not in that community. Um, and in the chat box, also a comment: AICL is amazing. Their reviews are fantastic. So, do you know that group? Could you spell out AICL? Or I'm I'm not familiar with that acronym American Indians in children's literature thank you so much <laughs> that's, Debbie, that's Debbie Reese's page and yeah she's further down in my discussion yep that is Debbie Reese's um, well that's who we call it Debbie Reese's page I know it's American yes. Debbie Reese and her co-writers wrote yes. the website yes. thank you yes. very good <laughs> um, you know I always say the smartest person in the room is the room if everybody yeah. together knows way more yeah that's good to share yeah. great and we'll get yeah. to more on that that's great Thank you. All right, so then we have Goggles, which is Ezra Jack Keats, who is well loved. I mean, there's a there's a sticker on almost every book that he has ever written. Um, he had he does wonderful things for the library world and for children's world, but there have been discussions about goggles. Does anybody have any idea why? Once again, we'll take a few minutes here in case you're using the chat box. You can also unmute yourself if you just want to get into this discussion. Um, we're all being humble today. He's not African American, says Pam from Missoula. He is not African American. You are right. He is not African American. The problem being, and, and this is a discussion, I mean, again, we can have this discussion for hours. And we can debate both sides of what does it mean to write fiction? If you know, you don't have to be a flying dragon to write a book about a flying dragon. Not, not don't take that inappropriately. I'm just saying that, you know, a lot of people will say you don't need to be African American to write an African American story. But the point is, if we're going to be inclusive and diverse, we need to be very careful that the cultures that we're writing about are correctly interpreted and correctly um, written about. Um, goggles comes about the um, the discussion about goggles comes about because not only is he not African American, um, but the illustrations also have been found to glorify um, living in a ghetto because the children are playing and um, and living what in what appears to be a ghetto. So again, then we're stereotyping African Americans by a white writer, an illustrator. 
so you could see where there would um, where um, this would feel in, it, it is inappropriate. Any other thoughts on that? I can't see the chat box, so I'm leaving it to Miss Joe to tell me. That's my job. Nope, nothing else coming in. I think we pretty much spot on. He's not African American, and you mentioned that he's um, there's some stereotype images and i just want to add on um, as an instructional designer i can tell you what we know about how people learn the, the things about cultures they don't personally have any experience with um, images are actually much more um, kind of impression to create a greater impression a more indelible impression even than words and text because of where they're um, interpreted in our brains. We interpret images, especially in moving images, way deep in our brain, down in the lizard part of our brain. So really where our emotions um, are. So it's it's really important that illustrations be considered too. And because um, those can have a really um, damaging effect on someone's uh, impression of a culture if the images are are biased or stereotyped. Yeah, exactly. So our next book, The Five Chinese, excuse me, The Five Chinese Brothers by Claire Hutt, Hutt Bishop. Any ideas what would be wrong, quote unquote, wrong with this book? And we'll give folks again a chance. And yep. it seems like everybody's in the chat box this morning. Um, and Kendall said something about the CSLP situation, something yes. about the summer yes. reading program. Yes, yes. And um, we're talking last year and this year, there were instances of stereotyping. And last year's really, really goes to this book. If you if you know what happened last year in CSLP, um, one of the posters went out or it was a bookmark. I can't remember what um, the one of the little aliens was made to look Chinese with the same eyes and they were colored yellow. Oh, yeah. These people are those brothers are yellow greenish yellow yeah yep yep, yep. and this, so this book cover applies that all chinese people look alike their skin tone is mocked by being uniform yellow color and again this is a white woman retelling a chinese fairy tale always dangerous territory <laughs> yeah, especially because i'm really interested in this last one though because i <laughs> Now for many people, um, you retelling of your fairy tales, those fairy tales are really deep, deep within a culture. Um, Native Americans especially have a very difficult time with other people, which they should. Other people retelling their stories. Those are culturally deep, their stories, and they're being retold by white people, culturally appropriated by white people. And that's the story. Um, this year's um, summer reading uh, CSLP with the um, fairy tales, of a cultures, especially in Nancy, the spider being being brought in as being imagine your story in like a fairy tale kind of instance that was very upsetting to the Native American culture. So again, it's and I was super surprised, especially someone who's been trying to deal with diverse and inclusive um, literature that either whomever was on the art um, group for CSLP did not notice that or did they did not have someone of other cultures, uh, you know, a variety of cultures on the CSLP um, art committee to make sure that that didn't happen. Sad news, but happened. Alrighty, so Joe is interested in knowing what is wrong with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, a beloved book and a beloved movie. Oh, just one little comment in the chat box I should share, and that is that uh, one, per, um, Ken, Kendall and, um, Impulse and says she's never read the book because the trailers for the movie gave her nightmares for years. I am not a fan of the first movie either. <laughs> and the book scared me, yes. <laughs> well, some really pretty horrific things happened to children in that book. Let's see, Roald Dahl, and this is another comment from Mary James out in Circle. Roald Dahl is mean. I thought he was really mean about things like physical appearance. Ah, and then um, and then uh, from Plains, we hear, I loved that movie, Nikki said. <laughs> I loved it too. So we'll right. be interested to hear what, you, this will be an interesting discussion. So um, Benjamin is suggesting that the Oompa Loompas 
um, kind of are portraying people of color who are a servant class. Um, then there's the chocolate river and the cupcake flowers. I think um, Nikki is actually waxing poetic there. I'm not sure. Um, but what, is it the is it the Oompa Loompas? Is that the? I mean, there there I could see there's probably a lot of issues now that I think about it with this book. It is. It is the original book. So um, the the originally when it was purchased the, uh, or you know written a long time ago, the Oompa Loompas were savages that. Um, he got from the African jungle and brought back to work as slaves in his factory. Oh dear. That has yeah. been tweaked in the book as you can hopefully imagine why, um, but it's still, you know, we're still catching the undertones. Someone still mentioned the undertones. You can still- These are those. still people who are colored funny and different and treated as servants. But all beloved books. I'm not, I'm, and you can go to the Billings Public Library's website. We must have four copies of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So I'm not, again, not telling you what you can and cannot have in your collection. I'm just asking you to say, take a second when you're looking at these books and be aware, step out of your culture and be aware of what might make it difficult for others. And if they continually see these kinds of books on display and, um, celebrated in your library how that may may make someone else feel um so again whether you keep them in your collection or not not my decision i'm not going to tell you what to do you have you know what's best for your community i just want you to make sure you're taking a moment to see what might be wrong any of these so, would be great for an opportunity to have a conversation though with parents or um teens about media literacy and how stories get told and what kinds of underlying um, currents are in those stories so they can still be really exactly useful why they should exactly why you'll still find them in a lot of um, libraries because they're great for research and for talking about exactly that these kind issues of, yeah if this not that kind of definitely all righty so these were a little bit more obvious these next ones not going to be so obvious and really going to be a little difficult. Um, these are what I call kind of okay representation in children's books. And if you have been somebody who's checked out the American Indians and Children's Literature website, you might already know why encounters on this list. These books are groundbreaking in a sense, but they do still have some issues. Anybody want to jump in on encounter? You can all unmute yourself. Anybody wants to come right out and say Remember, that? we're all very humble here. <laughs> In fact, I'll be the first one to say, I bought Encounter. I read Encounter. I thought Encounter was amazing. I read Debbie Reese's um, review and inward, not even inward cringed. I was, I was a little embarrassed. I don't know this book, so I can't comment. Anyone else? Beautiful. In it does look very pretty. It is. Anybody given any comment? Nope. Okay, let's talk about this. So, Encounters written by two female Native American writers who were published by the big publishers, which never happened. But it's an imagined retelling of the first meeting of um, European settlers and Native Americans. It's an, um, uh, it's a, um, uh, everything is roses, this is what should have happened kind of telling. But in nowhere in there does it tell that. When you so it comes story, off as a truth, as if it's it historically accurate, yes. when it's not really. Yes. And the problem that um, Debbie Reese pointed out is that this story needs to be read with an adult who can explain to them what actually did happen. Because again, we're back to Thanksgiving, only just turned around a little bit. Um, it just, it makes it seem like it was a lovely encounter, um, but never once does it say this is imagined. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, would, I don't think I would have spotted that. No. That's why it's helpful to have these kinds of discussions. It's really perilous, isn't it? Picking out it children's is. books. <laughs> and again, I humbly, 
humbly tell you, I loved this book. And then one of my assistants said, did you read Debbie Reese's review on Encounter? And I said, no, no, let me go read it. Oh, crap. <laughs> it's exactly what I said. Um, we still have book in the collection. I, you know, I mean, again, it, it is one that, um, it's a beautiful book. And I am so happy that some Native American women were published by one of the big publishing companies. That doesn't happen. But right. it's still whitewashing what happened between the Native Americans and the European settlers. And and there's a question from 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 Nikki. Is it supposed to be nonfiction? Is it kind of presented as nonfiction? It it, it, it may it didn't come across that way. Um, in publish in when we purchased it, it didn't come across that way in the um, OCLC you know, the Dewey Decimal stuff, none of that came across cataloging it. Um, but yeah, I mean, should it have been, may, you know, I mean, but even then that's, it's not true. It's fiction. It didn't happen that way. I mean, it makes it, as you can see by the front cover, it's a beautiful book and it makes it seem like they, they, they met and the sky was blue and the birds were singing and, you know, they were able to communicate to each other and that's not what happened. Yeah, a whitewash. That's what that's the that's the term we use for it making it yeah. look prettier than it really was and make it better. Yeah. And and we do that a lot with history, especially um his, his, yeah, especially in in our in our state that's I mean, we do have resources. I mean, you can we have um you know, tribal colleges and people who um we have authors, native authors here that can look at things. And, but you, no one is going to get this stuff right 100% of the time. No, no, it is not. It's not going to happen, even in the best books. And um, several of these um, books I've, we have used, two of these, not in Counter, but the other two we've used on our inclusivity book list. So we like them enough, but they still, like I said, these books are groundbreaking, but they have, you know, something that makes them just not perfect and i do do i think there's going to be a perfect children's book probably not um it's just not possible but we're getting there you know things get better okay elvin ho elvin ho elvin ho elvin ho you probably have this book series in your library i do anybody got any ideas what might possibly be wrong it's actually this particular book not the series in general Give everybody a chance to think about Alvin Ho for a minute. Let's see. Not familiar with it is the first comment. Anyone else want to give it a try? Be brave. Come on. I won't use your name as I mentioned the com in the comments. So I can't see it. So yeah. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm gonna click. Okay. So this is actually an Asian writer who has an Asian main character, a male Asian, not a male character, but he dresses up in a um, Native American costume, a stereotypical Native American costume for a birthday party. Uh -huh. And almost part of the book is about him finding all the parts and pieces he needs to dress up as this Native American. And the guest we had in the that actually did come in the chat box was that maybe the description of his friend with the eye patch was was the problem, but it really was that he actually he yeah let's I mean let's hope that nobody's in Montana is dressing up as Native Americans unless they are going to a powwow and they are Native American <laughs> or participating um, yeah yeah. And you know, I one of the reasons that um, Alvin Ho comes up on my list is because um, May, just ending, um, our May inclusivity list was um, Asian Pacific American. And that book, finding books to fit that category was very difficult, um, especially uh, male Asian Americans. And so I was super excited to find Alvin Ho. You know, of course it would have an issue in one of the books, but, um, it's again groundbreaking that there's a male Asian character, main character, um, and written by an Asian author. <laughs> but just one little, you know, 
the one little part that shouldn't have been there. All righty. On to Julian is a mermaid. So you can see that it's a Stonewall Book Award winner. Oh, let's see what comes into the, let's see. How about gender non-conforming people um, aren't mythical, although some of us do love mermaids. So is that the problem? Um, and, it's, and some people, for some people it has been. Um, for others, it's the fact that it's a um, cis woman writing about a Caribbean um, boy who, um, yes, is non-conforming. And yeah, there has been discussion of um, making it a, a little stereotypical, a little, yes, like you say, fairy tale character. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in, in portraying a non-conforming um, child, a child who is non-conforming to the, to the, to the binomial yes. uh, identification of, um, then we, we, you end up with something that is overly myth, mythical and not maybe very realistic. Yeah, yeah. That's um, it's, it's she, you know it's it is brave of her to to um, wander into this territory. I mean, you know, you got to you know you give a give an author credit for a, you know making an attempt to um, reach out to a broader community beyond her the cis community. Exactly, exactly, and that's where we. You're leading me wonderfully, Miss Joe. I my didn't mean to. <laughs> so good. I find this such an interesting topic because I have become more and more humble as I get older. <laughs> and that's the, 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 you know that's what that's what makes me happy is that as we do get older, we do start to. Um, I, well, I think it's all the stumbles I've made. Yeah. <laughs> I do think we kind of yeah do tend to learn hopefully learn from our mistakes. Um, this book in particular, Julian as a Mermaid, um, as Joe said, kind of makes you want to think about um, what it means to write from within the community as opposed to about a community. And that doesn't necessarily mean um, that Jul Julian's author, Jessica Love, is wrong for writing from about a community she's not a part of. You know, you can do great research and work with people from within a community to write a book about their community. Um, that's where, again, you as a collection development, being aware and doing your research as to the reviews on a book and the thoughts of the community of that book about that book. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with writing from with. Uh, about a community when you're not within the community, but it has to be done appropriately and um, respectfully. And, and here's, a, done that here's a really good comment from one of our attendees. I think my issue is that there aren't enough books by self-identifying people within the gender non-conforming group. So most of the books are still written by cisgender binary gender writers which isn't a problem as long as we are also lifting up in community voices. She points out that she really loves the book's general aim. And that's such a good point um, because, you know, it's important to understand, I think, that very simple asking yourself, is this book about a community written by someone outside the community and how well are they representing that community? Or does it give that community its own voice somehow? And um, a really good author can manage to do that. And it is not cut and dry. As you point out, these are good books. Um, but they just have. That's why it's important, I think, to look at them very critically. Yeah, yeah. And it's tough. You know, you got to get things done. You only have so many hours in the day. I need to get some books. To, I need to get some books ordered. I need this. Um, and so it's not an easy chore. And you're going to still buy a book, say, like Encounter and think it's amazing and then realize, oops, I, you know, but uh, I, I agree with your, with whomever spoke up about, it's important that someone 
that we also continue to support those who do not get the support of the publishing companies, say the Native Americans or the, uh, the, not, the transgender or any of those people, because you're right, they do not get support of the publishers. Right. And there's a debate about whether or not by allowing so someone like Jessica Love to write that book, are we keeping somebody who, from within that community from having the, the ability to write the same kind of book? Yeah, there is a, there is a sort of um, Im implied or continual bias that we perpetuate if we don't give people of that community their own voice. And, um, and, it, and as the people who buy those books, we're helping to make those decisions um, at, for the publisher. And <laughs> so that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting kind of economic spin on this topic. Yes, it's, and it's a debate. And this is not, <laughs> this is not an easy discussion. And, it, and um, this whole discussion about making your, your um, collection more diverse and inclusive is not an easy thing to do. You know, it isn't like, if I buy these seven books, I have a diverse collection, or if I buy these 20, I feel inclusive. That's not how this works. So this is a never ending, always cycle of debate and discussion, which I think is a wonderful thing to have. I mean, that's how things rise up and authors become um, who we need them to be is when we continue to debate about what makes something um, diverse and inclusive. I, I once heard someone describe it um, as kind of looking, and I, I mentioned give, giving our culture its own voice, but also how authentic that voice is. And, um, and I think those are kind of terms you can keep in your head as you're looking at content and trying a movie or, I mean, some things are never, um, or it's going to take a long time for a, for a less, a, a member of a, um, a, a small group um, that is not part of the dominant culture to rise up and um, and and have their own voice and you know I mean there's some things we we never would accept today we won't accept um, yep. uh, white people dressing up in blackface and playing the parts of African Americans or Native Americans dressing up in red face we won't accept that but over time, we still have more subtle now um, uh, biases that are and and stereotypes that are occurring that we have to really work even harder to watch out for. And here's a good comment in the chat box. Um, and this is from Circle. When she worked at Barnes and Noble, she lobbied their publisher, Sterling, to publish Native American books with Native American illustrators and writers, but they would only publish ready to publish stories. They were not able to develop writers and illustrators that needed a hand up. And that that is a innate bias in the culture that you have to already be an established writer or illustrator to you know, be able to tackle a subject and, and that, yeah, it's, it's, it, it isn't something that's easy to fix overnight, even though we know it's, even if you can identify when it's wrong, you can't necessarily fix it. That is, yep, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's, all we can do is continue to make um, the most diverse, more, as many diverse looks available as we can and continue to make, uh, People, minor, people of minority groups feel welcome, so they will continue to look for those items and purchase those items, and then the publishers will see it, and hopefully it will continue. That's what we can do. Um, but yeah, it's this is not going to end overnight, nor is it going to be, nor are we, the, we're the only, we're not the only side of this triangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me continue from the chat box. This is some good conversation going on there. Um, and this is in response to Mary Jane's comment. I think you're on to something. If we haven't supported those voices in the past, those will be fewer Native Americans going into illustration in the first place. And seeing it as a possibility, which leads to fewer book pitches and therefore fewer ready to publish stories. So yeah, we have a part to play in selecting um, books that do um, fully represent, you know, as you did when you selected the book Encounter written by two Native American women. Um, 
So, you know, you can, you can some, it's, it's, you can sometimes get it half right. You can make a step in the right direction. And, um, and it is, like I said, we all came into this I, at the very beginning, we said it's a very humbling experience. Um, but I think being willing to be humble and, and then we have one more comment that that's a great point. It, I think, um, you know, this is just having this conversation today, give yourself all a pat on the backs for being willing to spend a little time this afternoon talking about it um, is really a step in the right direction. Exactly. That is exactly right. That's all we can do. When we know better, we do better. And we just have to keep moving forward and pushing forward and trying to, uh, to do best we can to make um, things a little bit better. Hopefully, all of us together someday, it'll make it happen. And a couple more comments. It's, it, these are good points for all groups to keep in mind. Yep. And awareness is the first step. Exactly. Right. So then, all of this is occurring. This is all we are thinking about when we're, this all came about just because somebody asked us for a diverse book list. So this is all that's wobbling around in the three children's department heads um, at Billings Public Library. And so we decided we needed a quote unquote expert. And so we had just recently met an associate professor up at MSUB. Um, and she is, her focus in her doctorate studies was inclusivity and diversity. She is of a diverse um, and minority group, several minority groups. And she's also, she is on the uh, several um, book award lists. So we thought, well, let's just grab her. So it was she, Cindy, myself, the other children's assistant, um, and we started this kind of committee to start looking at how we developed our collection and how we could be more diverse and what were we going to do with these, this list? Um, how were we going to get this list out? What was going to happen to this list? So this is how I felt. <laughs> this is how I felt. Where do I start? How do I even begin? Because, you know, I pick up a book and one book list says it's fantastic. The next book list says there's this wrong with it. Um, we all, you know, we just talked about how minority authors don't get published. So how do we find inclusive books if they're not being published? How do you find a hashtag on voices, books from within a community, books about a community? So I wanted to kind of talk to you about where we go. So there it is, American Indians and Children's Literature, Debbie Reese. She's really good with indigenous stories. We look at the ALA Book, Print, and Media Awards. Again, the Rainbow List, um, Stonewall Books, uh, Batch Elder, American, African, excuse me, Arab American Book List. So um, another one I found in the last couple of months, I'm your neighborbooks.org. This is a resource for immigrant books. So refugees and immigrants from other countries, books about, um, this is where I found a good amount of my Asian American books. Um, then diversebooks.org, which is We Need Diverse Books, and they list lists of lists, lots and lots of lists of um, important book lists. And then there's the ALA Celebrate Diversity book list. Um, the Billings Public Library is actually, um, our lists are actually part of the ALA Celebrate Diversity list. Um, you can go on their website and there's lists of um, different places, is, places, is, places um, book lists. And then there's a um, diversebookfinder.org. This is a great website for, um, it allows you to do analysis of the diversity of your book list. Uh, of your books, your, your uh, collection. Uh, remember though, when I said the difference between diverse and inclusive. So this will allow you to um, analyze your book collection for diversity. So it's gonna give you an idea of what percentage has African-American characters, what percentage has Asian-American characters. But remember, it's not gonna tell you if those books are culturally appropriate, or if that makes your um, collection um, inclusive, okay? So it's gonna give you an idea of where you need some more, um, which cultures or um, groups you might need more books of, but it's not gonna tell you if those are appropriate. 
So if you do go look on book diversebookfinder.org, um, make sure you're not you're not taking that as a recommendation that you also go further. Okay. Because no matter um, even, just because there's an African American character on there is not making mean it that it's a respectful book, you know, to the African American community. So what are so since this whole started on these inc these lists from the um, Human Relations Commission, I just kind of want to tell you what became of the Billings Public Library's inclusivity list. So what we decided to do is have a master list. It's in a Google Doc that all of us have access to, and it includes different subject areas. So we have race, religion, socioeconomic, differently abled cultures, and under each one of those is um, different lists we could develop. So under religion, it's like Muslim, um, Christianity, atheism, um, socioeconomic, we talk about homelessness. So we have all these master lists with subject areas under them that we could then build lists of. The great thing about this list is that it really does help those of us developing our collection look at what kind of books don't we have what kind of books do we not have subjects about? So are we, do we have books that cover homelessness? Do we have books that cover um, autism? The characters are autistic or um, OCD or a parent who has a mental illness. Seeing those listed and written down really helps um, me kind of focus on what kind of books should I be looking for instead of the generically um, similar ones that we've all seen for quite a long time. Um, and then each one of those lists has its own list that we add books to. So as we're buying books, we'll say, oh, this has a character with OCD and the father is um, unemployed, so they're homeless. So that book will be included on several different lists. Um, and then we work as a team to build a monthly list. The month of May was um, um, Asian, American, Asian Pacific American book list. And so then we went to our master list and kind of looked at that and said, do, what do we have and what do we need to buy to add to our collection? Um, again, that's how I noticed we didn't have any Asian American males in our, book, in our books. So we went looking for that. And then of course, as we're looking for them, we're looking at reviews, we're looking at um, uh, you know, people's opinions about what that book means, what that book tell, you know, how does it fit? Is it about the community or from within the community? Who's the author? So it's, it's a very detailed and arduous process. And as the last bullet point says, sometimes that list is very difficult to fill, as in the, Afri uh, the Asian Pacific American list. That was very, very difficult. Very difficult. Um, I was not aware of how difficult that list was going to be. There's just not books written now, there are books, because we had chosen it to be Asian Pacific American, we really wanted those books to be about kids who are Asian or Asian Pacific and lived in America. You could find books um, set in other countries, and if we chose to expand upon that, we could have, and may, it may have made the list a little easier. Questions couple, about this? A couple part? comments in the chat box that, you know, your lists are really helpful, so thank you for sharing them. And, and that Billings has a kind of weight behind its authority that might help convince some more hesitant people in other libraries that these are worthy books. I mean, obviously you are still looking for good children's literature that has, you know, um, messages for children and, and, and are interesting and well-written. Um, I think that's important too to say, you know, this is, um, inclusivity or diversity is not the only uh, criteria. Um, yeah, and that's what makes it, that's what makes it even more difficult is if we could just pick some books, you know, oh, that has an Asian American character and throw it in the list. Oh, yeah, that you don't, that's, life. that is not what you want to do, right? No, no, yeah. I don't, and that's what makes my life, you know, come the end of the month when, like right now we're just finishing, um, getting June's list ready, which is LBGT, LB, LBT, oh my goodness, LGBTQ plus list. Um, that one's not as difficult, thank goodness. It was more difficult last year. Every year that list gets harder, easier, thank you. But um, 
that is, it isn't a matter of just finding characters who fit that list. It also has to be a good book. It has to be a good book, book that you're in one that your community is going to embrace and um, okay. uh, that, you know, because it isn't going to, you're not doing any good if it sits on the shelf because people, because it's not a good book, not a book that your community wants or, exactly. or will check out. So yeah, there's a lot to this. It's not a exact science. No, no, and it's a lot of work. Um, so every month we post a new list. October was our, October of last year was our very, very first one. And it was just a combination of a bunch of different books that may at one point fit into the list. So there was a book about Muslim Americans and African Americans and a woman and um, a religion, you know, and so all of that kind of stuff. December, we chose to do religion. Um, so that had atheism and, um, agnostic. Yes, there are books for children on ag agnostic. Um, January, we chose to do mental health awareness, which really um, made me um, feel really good about the amount of books about mental health um, issues for children. Um, usually the books include somewhere between 20 and 30. It really depends on how easy it is for us to fill that list. You know, last year, last month, May, it had 20 because we couldn't find any board books. Board books were really, really hard. Um, and then we publish it ourselves on our children's webpage. It's on a, our Great Reads for Children's webpage. And then our social media team posts it off on social media for us. And then we also email it because that was this last bullet point was what started the whole thing. So this is also emailed to our school librarians. We, um, when we first started trying to get this list out there, we emailed the school district and said, um, our, our director did and said, you know, these lists are coming out. How would you like them? And he said, I don't want to see them. I don't want to hear about them. Um, if you send them to my librarians, they are not allowed to publicize them, but they can have them in case a child asks for them. Um, this was very, very disheartening because that meant, you know, we were not able, there are, pro there are children who aren't getting, getting to know about books that probably could change their lives. Um, but the school district was in a very difficult time. We had a brand new, um, what do you call it? Uh, the county commissioner guy was brand new. There was things going on. And so we just said, okay, fine. That you, you do you, you, you'll do us. And we'll just, we'll just take it on. So, um, we had a big party in October. We invited everybody we could think of. Um, the paper was there. The news station was there. And um, we promoted it via that way. Now we didn't we didn't want to promote it as yay, look at us, aren't we amazing? We wanted it to be Billings Public Library strives to be diverse and inclusive. And and here is an example of how we're doing that. Um, so it wasn't a yay us kind of thing. It was a you can come here, we want you here, we have books for you here. Um, and I will tell you that um, probably like in February, January, February this year, we started to notice a real change in the population that was coming to Billings Public Library mm -hmm. in the sense that we saw a more diverse collection of people coming to story time, coming to our kids programs, hanging out in the children's area, asking us for book recommendations that we weren't getting before. So by, by, by pushing some of this information out to your public, you were also inviting new audiences in. And I just want to point out in the chat box a, a, a statement that I really agree and how very prescient it was for you to focus on mental health awareness in January just before this, all of this crazy COVID stuff kind of hit the fan. I wish I could say that I had that kind of mental thought that that That's, was going to happen. <laughs> just but. lucky but uh, um, we, we are getting cl very close to the top of the hour so if you if anyone does need to leave feel you know we won't be offended if you do um, but uh, uh, I know you're not quite done yet so actually I am at my end of my slide oh okay there. so it's basically up to anybody who has any questions any thoughts any needs um, I did not um, Put the link to the to the children's page on here. But if you go to billingslibrary.org, the children's page, our inclusivity list is um, a link on there under Great Reads for Children. 
You can email me at any time if you have questions. I will say that um, our newest director, Gavin's been here, what, three, four years now, um, really does want this list to be a, a jumping point for other libraries. I was, you know, October 2019, the day of the party, I had a stack of about 25 papers of, you know, statements of concern ready to go for anybody who came up to the children's desk and was in sight angry at me about whatever books were on display. And I will tell you that since October of 2019, we have not, we have had one, one statement of concern and it was about a board book that wasn't even on display, that had nothing to do with anything. So um, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I, I will add to um, that our, uh, just very brief, one of the projects from our Summer Leadership Institute from last summer um, was we actually had an out-of-state attendee and she worked for a community college in Minnesota and her job was to try to make her library more inclusive for the very changing community that was coming to her community college and and um, they made you know just a lot of surface kinds of um, changes certainly made changes in the collection but they also kind of changed the decor a bit and mm -hmm. um, you know there's so many things that you that we can do in libraries to invite new new people in another comment in the chat box um, the best of intentions can so easily take us in the wrong direction and it's easy to just avoid these kinds of books in our rural communities but it this really helps so thank you and then another comment my new favorite book author that writes um, YA is TJ Klune that's K-L-U-N-E his new book is House in the Cerulean Sea and he has a teen series that's coming in June or July the extraordinaires both are awesome thank you for that recommendation and then one more comment I remember from the Office of Intellectual Freedom Workshop several years ago that there's been a big shift from challenges from the public about content to challenges from staff about internal repression of displays, events, yeah. et cetera. Interesting. Yeah. We have to we have to reach out to our own community first, right? Very good. I really hope I enjoyed this conversation. I hope you guys did as well. Um, and thanks, Mary James. I haven't read that one yet. Okay. But everybody, we could probably do this once a month and um, <laughs> get a really good oh, conversation yeah, going yeah and I thank you so much um, Alice for um, just I keep saying your name wrong Ellis for um, Alan, uh, Alan. Oh, geez, last name is Ellis you it's please okay. forgive okay. me it's been a rough <laughs> rough couple months um, all kinds of things. It's Alan, thank you for putting this together and for sharing your journey with us I really appreciate it most definitely. Again, uh, we need a Montana Children's and Youth Book Appreciation Club. I think we do. That's a good point. <laughs> and uh, one more comment uh, before I stop our recording. I'm working on broadening our Native American collection, and this information is going to be really helpful. So thanks. And I will stop our recording. And thank you once again. <laughs>